So yeah, thank you for the interview. And um, you've received the Hermann Staudinger um, Award from the GDCH. What does that mean to you to receive this award? Oh, it means in fact very, very much because I'm, of course, for a long time in polymer science and in 84 I joined my first meeting in Freiburg and there were always Staudinger lectures and then in days where we did not have electronic libraries, I was reading the old papers and the Stauding as we know him today yeah, is of course famous, but this guy was a real genius and to receive the Staudinger medal indeed is a personal uh, honor I really appraise very high. Yeah, and um, can you say a bit about your research, please? Well, um, my research is very colorful because, of course, I'm an old man. I'm now 61. And as I told you, my first meeting was 84, so you can calculate the difference. My research is mostly working with young people. Yeah, And whenever a young person is getting a professorship, I have to start a new topic. So I think in my long career, I did a number of things in polymer science, but what I'm currently most proud about is really sustainable polymers. So I would say the contemporary part of my my research is characterized by all the things you see on the outside that we have invented polymers which are perfect, which we do not degrade and to make polymers also a part of our sustainable future. This is currently my major concern. So that maybe explains why you have so many different topics um, you're researching. Uh, on and um, can you give an example for what you just said for this sustainable direction? Yeah, uh, maybe chemical industry will not like it if you listen to the interview, but the current uh, business operation principle of chemistry, industrial chemistry is currently collapsing. So everything is built on oil or, or was built on coal, but chemistry is only taking 7% of the oil and it taking, of course, the best cuts, the primary fractions, and this is where polymers are made of. And indeed, if the concept of burning fuel, of burning oil is vanishing, chemistry will have to take either everything or chemistry will get very expensive. And this is why there's a major trend to put, especially polymers, of course, uh, on the base of regrowing resources. So what we are exploring in one set of projects is indeed how we can use side streams of biomass. This could be wood, this could be indeed corn stober, uh, rice, uh, uh, rap, uh, rapeseed straw. So all the things we cannot eat yeah, and to turn them into base chemicals where you finally can do polymers from. And this works remarkably well. So from the big classes of polymers, there is a substitute practically in every class and it does not even come with a compromise in properties. And the, I think this is, is the big trend. And of course, we hope that also the future world is full of polymers. We all go to the supermarket and I'm personally uh, sometimes offended when I have to take a paper bag because it's not very, very stable mechanical, it's getting wet. If so, to say the future bag would be made of plastic again with all the advantages, however, being a safe and sustainable product, I would call that progress. Um, I think you've also worked on artificial photosynthesis. Yes. And um, also the chemical use of carbon dioxide. Can you say a few words about that? Yeah, well, I'm more proud indeed about uh, the artificial photosynthesis because it's a long-standing project and again I had to work I think overall with about 100 people on that. So it's really a, a long, long thing. It was a dream of my youth, but not only my dream, uh, to use uh, sunlight to drive chemical conversions. And of course we know it from nature, this is called photosynthesis, uh, but photosynthesis in nature is remarkably inefficient, which means a typical higher plant is using only 0.3% of the energy for biomass growth. So the harvest we have, of course, name it biodiesel or so, is comparably low. And I will defend nature. Nature is not only there to grow. Nature has to improve. Nature has to be beautiful. So that we think nature only creates biomass is our mistake. However, if you replace such a system by a polymer photosynthetic system and I think this is what I'm proud about. We made it from very very simple base chemicals. We created a photocatalyst and the most refined version, this is not only my work now, is having an overall efficiency of 8% which as you can calculate is 26 times higher than the one of plants. 
So the productivity of these photocatalysts is really extraordinary. And um, how do you find your research topics? Ah, this is a very, I would say, even humanistic question. Research topics come mostly, I would say, from society and from art, from inspiration. Yeah, it's not that you think about, oh, it would be nice to have such a bottom and you start to do research on that. There's a little seed of a thought in your brain and it might come from a discussion, might come in deep or from an art piece you observe and then you really go on and go on and go on. In the case of photosynthesis, it's even the Faust which inspired me to that because I don't know, most people don't know the scene, but in the first meeting between Faust and Mephistoteles, yeah, they tried to barter on the price of a soul, yeah, and Mephistoteles is offering scientific inventions to the scientist, yeah, and one of them is indeed uh, artificial photosynthesis. Bäume, die sich täglich neu begrünen. I have to say that in German because I know the Faust only in German. And then Mephistopheles says, indeed, diese, diese bitte sei dir gewährt. This wish is easy to fulfill. Yeah. And so this indeed made me think how to do that. And it was not so difficult, I have to say. But without Mephisto. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky enough. <laughs> Great. And you've also received the award for, um, for promoting young talents. Um, and I think you do a lot about that in China or also have projects um, you're doing in China. Is that right? I think indeed science is international. And again, I think maybe I'm a scientist, but uh, I think Alexander von Humboldt said that uh, every scientist should do teaching. So the teaching researcher. And I think I know what he means by that. So in my, my long time, indeed more of 60 of my group leaders become leading professors. So big guys running the world. And the good thing, what I'm proud about is that most people do not know. Uh, because these people are so self-standing, so independent that you cannot even identify a shul. So half of my indeed habilitants and professors are Germans. Yeah. China is something new. It's a source of talent. And again, we are talking about global pollution and global solutions and sustainability. And they're simply a country with 1.4 billion people who has a lever, which is maybe 20 times as big as the lever, lever in Germany. So if you can educate those people, if you can grab the talents over there, you do something good for science. Yeah, and it needs these Chinese talents who come. They're hardworking. They're among the best. But it, it really just points to the fact that we have a global talent pool, that Germany as a country relies on the import of heads of talents and that the real fight in science is not on topics. It's on persons doing your research. You have also the kitchen lab of the Max Planck Institute. How is that connected to the rest of your research? <laughs> Mostly. So this is, you're very, really well deformed. The kitchen lab is indeed uh, a little pleasure, which I started really just for fun, but which has turned out as one of the most productive labs in my institute. It's a typical thing. You start something Dadaistic and it ends up the wrong way, namely turning into a success story. And then it's work again. So uh, I think about 10 to 20 years, there was the big wave of molecular cuisine which means indeed Michelin star chefs were using the tools of chemistry, rotational vaporizer in cooking their food with them. Yeah, and here indeed the intellectual principle is the inversion. I wanted to do my chemistry, however, with instruments you can find in an ordinary household kitchen. So we indeed changed our complete raw material base. So we took flour, everything you can in principle eat or which is not toxic and which you can buy in a supermarket. Then we took indeed household machines and again an, a noodle machine or an, a pasta machine is an extruder, but this extruder is maybe 100 times cheaper simply because of scale, because 100 million people do noodles, but just a few people do extrusion. So all these things are found in my 
kitchen lab and then I can allow school kids, people who want to do their facharbeit, yeah, in the age of 16, 17 to go to a Max Planck Institute. Well, they get, of course, a white coat and protection glasses. This is clear, but they can work on the full legal protection because I can guarantee that nothing unusual can happen to them. Of course, everyone can cut into a finger also in the household kitchen and then they do research. And the crazy thing is uh, this research is highly valuable. So we already invented a number of catalyst replacement materials from those procedures because in the very end, uh, top cooking and top chemistry is very similar. <laughs> That's great. But um, how does it work um, that school children, for example, do research there? Well, it's mostly nowadays a legal thing because we have uh, protection rights. Yeah, and we have a number of very involved teachers who say our kids are talented chemists. And I found out that, that we lose many of these kids on the way to university because chemistry is not really supported. So we have a network of teachers and then, of course, they send their people here for a weekend for an afternoon or weekend. They're doing their experiments and usually as they can be created, they can they're getting infected with the idea. We have a project on indeed on soil improvement and then they go into the garden and try our polymers, which we develop as an additive to improving very bad soil in their own garden. And when they have the big tomatoes, you see pictures of big tomatoes you are getting sent on your mobile phone and you see the pride in them. So they understand that chemistry is not necessarily bad and the killer of the world, but also a part to secure our food and to protect our environment. And this is what you can mediate in the kitchen lab. So any polymer you want to deliver in your own garden, be sure must be cooked from ordinary biomass or household chemicals, because else it would be forbidden. Mm. And the um, you just said that um, you made um, lots of developments there or maybe you had patterns there um, that was created um, from the scientists during you um, developing these things for the students or how is that connected or do scientists also use this kitchen lab? <laughs> so they, 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 they shoot kids usually and again we have to be realistic. You can make big, big inventions but not in the 30 hours indeed a, a school kid is able to spend for a facharbeit. Yeah, so this is this is not possible. No, when there was this magic place of the kitchen lab, scientists start to sneak in. Yeah, this is the real point. No, it's not only students, it's also scientists, it's also pregnant technicians. We usually cannot work, but want to work. Yeah, and many people meet indeed there. And this is the special, I would say, flavor of the kitchen lab. It's the scientists developing the new catalyst. I think my biggest success story is that from a noodle, shimmy, a noodle dog, a noodle machine, we make a catalyst which is able really to uh, recycle polypropylene in a in a properly manner, which means not combusted, but disintegrated into monomers. Yeah, and this is can be only done with this noodle catalyst. It's very crazy. Yeah, we tried to find other solutions, but this noodle catalyst. Yeah, and there's a science in between. So once you have the material, you start also with the shul kits to characterize it with the tools, which is acidity, basicity, TPD, even microscopy. And then they see, they discover the world of the very small entities in their materials. But the scientist then cannot stop and sees the new things indeed, and then is applying the noodle catalyst and it turns out to be indeed superior. <laughs> okay, so we need, I don't know, a very simple environment, uh, lots of fun and different people together and then it works out. Uh, this is, I know, a dangerous statement because it can be misunderstood. I think the most important secret of creativity is no boundaries, it's play. So Kitchen Lab in this sense is that you can play with science. It's a platform to improvise, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have too many money, if you have too many plans, yeah, I think the creativity is dead. So money or overfunding indeed kills the creativity. But this is no excuse for politics not to fund science. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. We, of course, so did, it's this interplay indeed between a, a little freedom and indeed the sufficient, of course, uh, instrumentation you need then to turn, of course, even a noodle catalyst into a real product. Yeah. 
Um, and what are you doing when you're not doing science? You just said you um, got inspired by literature or, and um, art. Yes, so the, my wife is an artist and indeed I love to join her for all the modern art exhibitions because I see no big difference indeed between modern art. Yes, they're using photographs and even videos and all the things but and we are using molecules but the tools indeed to construct pictures to construct novelty i always see similarities to my own field yeah beside that of course i do have two daughters who think that cooking is a male occupation so even in their choice of partners they found person who are able to cook yeah because indeed obviously yeah at home yeah i have to cook yeah it's a part of my household uh, and of course the other side and i hardly have time in corona for that i'm a singer in a punk rock band and i still wow. do that very much yeah and we are even local celebrities i have to said so but again i would love to have more time for that and of course you know it's my age so the generation which is now 60 around 60 they were born with this type of music and we continue that that sounds great fun it is Anything else you would like to add? No, maybe indeed again about Hermann Staudinger as the last point, yeah, because Hermann Staudinger was before he turned polymer science, before he took the freedom to be obsessed with polymers, was indeed a more than excellent organic chemist. And whenever you see genius, you can even read the early papers and they inspire you. And I just can tell you, uh, polymer science is far from being dead, even after 100 years, because even in the old works of Hermann Staudinger, there are treasures and pieces which were never used again in polymer science, because no one had maybe the braveness to read the old papers after he became successful and after, of course, he later got the Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm.